So this is an introduction to multivariable calculus, you could say. I'll just say multivariable functions. Multivariable calculus is about multivariable functions. And we will do a little calculus, but more importantly, I want to get you used to the idea of a multivariable function. I do like bringing these things up in the context of certain applications, but for the sake of simplicity today, we won't talk about any applications. What's that? That's a Z. Mathematicians make Zs with little lines through them because otherwise they can look like twos. You say, well, I make my twos like that. I used to make my twos like that too, but I mean, I'm, you get less patient as you get older. And so now I make my twos like that. Z is a common letter used for the dependent variable, dependent, depend, I'm spelling that wrong, oh, sorry. Dependent variable for a multivariable calculus function that has two independent variables, X and Y. Z equals F of X comma Y. There's two independent variables that can indeed vary independently of each other. Oh, let's say, let's make it some fairly simple. Let's say it's X squared plus Y squared. There's my formula for this multivariable calculus function. Function of two variables. I'm going to show you a little bit of funny notation here before I think about graphing this. This notation is used in more advanced math classes. For example, I, I use it in my differential equations and linear algebra class that I teach. If plain linear algebra classes, you'll see this notation. Maybe even in multivariable calculus, maybe even Dr. Yang uses this notation. Actually, I'm teaching multi this spring. So I will use that notation. I think he uses this. A way to conceptualize or emphasize that the input involves two variables is in a sense, a two-dimensional point in maybe an XY plane is to emphasize that the domain of this function is called two-dimensional space, denoted R2, where the R is written with this extra line in it. Why? Because it's fun. Wait, is that? Well, it's also just what mathematicians do. R2 with this funny looking R effectively represents two-dimensional space. In other words, a plane. What plane? Well, effectively any plane you want. So does that mean there are different R2s depending on different planes? Well, mathematically, we sort of identify them all as the same plane, even if they are drawn in different spots. This is the domain here. of this function, domain. And what's over here, I'm writing as an R, that represents one dimensional space, you could say. One dimensional space. You could say it's a line, or if you wanted to, or you could say even the real line the R actually represents the real numbers. This fancy looking R represents the real numbers. So is this R2 somehow represent two real numbers? Yeah, as points. We could think of X comma Y as being a point in the plane with real number coordinates. When you write this R over here, I like to call this the codomain. Now, maybe you've never had a teacher who's ever labeled something the codomain. 
That's a word I like using. Some people use the word range, but I think that's a little bit misleading based on how you've heard the word range in the past as the set of all possible outputs of a function. And in fact, this function, if X and Y are real numbers, never has negative outputs. So even though this real number system, this codomain includes negative numbers, we're never gonna get a negative number out of this if we only allow ourselves to plug in real numbers for X and Y. Because of that, the function is said to be not onto. Not every possible number in the codomain is a possible output. But how do you graph this? With ordinary calculus graphs, the x-axis is the independent variable and the y-axis is the dependent variable. You imagine letting x vary on the horizontal x-axis and figuring out the corresponding y. And as x varies, you get a curve. Here, with such a function like this, I guess we got to let x and y vary over some plane. An xy plane points with these coordinates in an xy plane. And as that happens, the z will change. And the z, I guess, it goes in a third direction, upwards, say. The xy plane maybe is horizontal, and the z axis goes up and down, positive upward. And as x and y vary over that two-dimensional plane, it should make some intuitive sense that the z will change in such a way that maybe instead of a curve, you get a surface for the graph. And that indeed is what happens. Instead of a curve, you get a surface. What does the surface happen to look like for this example? It looks like a bowl. That's what it looks like. Kind of like a higher dimensional version of a parabola. I mean, this is quadratic. That should make some intuitive sense. So instead of a curve that's a parabola like this, you get a parabolic bowl shape for the graph. I'm not curving this, but I hope that makes some intuitive sense. How should I try to draw this? Well, there's lots of different ways. The most typical way I draw it is like this. This is supposed to be imagined with perspective, like an art class. You say, wait a minute, I don't like art. You have to imagine this axis, this right here, as the x-axis coming, well, for you guys, off the screen towards you and a little towards your left. For me, it's off the paper. And that's the positive x-axis. The negative x-axis goes behind the screen, behind the paper, but I'm drawing it anyway. The positive y-axis goes to the right, and the positive z-axis goes upward. In this picture, if I were to draw the xy plane, you have to, again, imagine it with perspective. I'd want to draw something about like this, kind of going into the screen there. Imagine. you got to use your imagination. Whenever you're drawing or imagining something with perspective, it is all in your imagination. So x and y vary over that plane, and given any point in the plane with certain x and y coordinates, I can plug into this function to find z. Let's pick an example. For example, what is z when x is 2 and y is 3? Can I evaluate this function when x is 2 and y is 3? Sure. 2 squared plus 3 squared. That's what the formula would say to do. To get 4 plus 9, 13. Z is 13 when X is 2 and Y is 3. Where is that in this picture? X is 2, Y is 3. I could try to draw that point right around there in the plane, but that's not a point on the graph. I got to go up 13 units. Uh, imagining with this perspective, it's in front of the screen here. So I probably want to put it a little lower than the 13 on the axis if I'm imagining that point being in the front of the screen. Now I do that for every point in the plane. Ha, ha, ha. 
yeah, you're going to get a bowl shape. Can I draw it perfectly? No way. I can cannot draw it perfectly. I can only just do my best and say that's decent. It's a bowl shape going up forever and ever as X and Y move away from the origin as they both go to infinity. Yeah. If you head off this direction, both X and Y are going to plus infinity. If you head off this direction into the screen, y is going to plus infinity and x is going to minus infinity. If you head off that direction going into the screen, they're both going to minus infinity. If you head off this direction to the left and in front of the screen, x is going to plus infinity and y is going to minus infinity. But no matter which direction you move, the output of z keeps getting bigger and bigger. We might be interested in rates of change, derivatives. of this function, how fast does z change as, say, x changes or as y changes? Derivatives can measure those. They're called partial derivatives when it's a function of two variables. And the notation is a little different. So again, same example here. z equals f of x, y equals x squared plus y squared. If I differentiate z with respect to x, here's how I write it. I make my d's kind of fancier looking. Curvy d, you might say. But you don't say curvy d, you just say d. dz dx. That's called a partial derivative. Could I use an ordinary d instead of a curvy d. Yes, I could. There's nothing stopping me from using an ordinary d, and there might even be some science textbooks that do. The curvy d, which I don't think is a Greek letter, is just meant to emphasize, hey, this function depends on more than one variable. This is a partial derivative. Should I put f prime? Mm, that's probably not a good idea because just a plain old prime would not tell me which, vari which variable I'm differentiating with respect to. Some books put a subscript, f sub x, x comma y, to mean differentiate with respect to x. And the answer is 2x plus zero, which is just 2x. When you find the derivative with respect to x, you treat the y as if it's a constant. Since it doesn't involve any x's, its derivative with respect to x is zero. This one involves an x, its derivative is 2x. I could also find the partial derivative with respect to y. Written that way or this way. And the answer is zero plus 2y, which simplifies to 2y. It's okay to continue using the x comma y notation in both cases, even though the answer just depends on one variable in each case. Sometimes it'll be a mixture. For example, if f of x, y is, say, x squared times y cubed, if that were my example, then the partial of z with respect to x, treating the y as a constant, would be 2xy cubed. The y cubed just stays as it is. And the partial of z with respect to y would be 3x squared y squared. To compute this one, I treated the y as a constant. To compute this one, I treated the x as a constant. These partial derivatives can be thought of as rates of change. Back in this picture here, for the first example, this 2x, if I plug in a specific point like x is 2, y is 3, the partial derivative of z with respect to x at that point, 2, 3, is 2 times 2 is 4. I just replaced x with 2 there, is all I did. That means 
if I go back up to this graph and try to somehow measure the slope of the surface in the x direction, letting x increase, but not y, the rate of change would be 4. The slope would be 4 of this line that I'm trying to draw with perspective. It's supposed to be all the points on this line are supposed to have the same y coordinate of 3. It's like a tangent line in the x direction. It's supposed to be kind of coming out of the screen at you. And if I do it with the partial derivative with respect to y, I would get 6 because y is 3 at this point. The slope in the y direction is a bit steeper here. This line is supposed to be going supposed to be parallel to the YZ plane, parallel to the, to the paper. It's a bit steeper in that direction than the other line was. That's pretty much impossible to draw exactly right. You have to use your imagination. But the point I'm trying to make is you can think about these with partial derivatives. How are we going to apply this on the homework due next Monday? We're going to apply this to help us understand what are called level curves of this. And we're also going to apply a different idea for those level curves as well called implicit differentiation. Let me give you a brief summary of that topic, though there's no homework to do on this until next Monday. To help us understand this graph, hang on with me. It's also helpful to cut it with horizontal planes and create something called a contour map, which is similar to maps you've seen on paper of mountainous regions where the curves you see correspond to elevations. You've, you all should have seen such maps before. Mm -hmm. X squared plus Y squared equals a constant will be different. I'll be cutting that surface, that bowl shape with different planes at constant values of Z. I can pick different constants and I get different curves that intersect these different planes. Oh, well, let's say we pick the constant four. Say the constant is four. What does the curve of intersection of the plane at z equals 4 look like with this bowl shape? It would look like the graph of the equation x squared plus y squared equals 4, which you should remember from your past math classes is a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. What implicit differentiation helps us do is understand this curve. Now, this curve is pretty simple. It's a circle. But in general, when you've got a multivariable function and you are looking at places where it's constant, you will not get a circle. You'll get some strange and wild curve. Implicit differentiation helps us understand this curve. Let's do one example in two minutes understanding this curve. For example, I might like to know at the point, let's make this point be one half square, uh, actually one square root of three. That is a point on this curve because it satisfies this equation. One squared is one, square root of three, square root is three. One plus three is four. I might want to know what is the slope of that curve there. One way to do it would be to take this equation and solve for y as a function of x and find the derivative and plug in x equals 1. Another way to do it is with something called implicit differentiation. Assume y is a function of x. And differentiate this equation as it is with respect to x. 
x squared differentiates to 2x. What does y squared differentiate to in this context? Not zero, because I'm assuming y is a function of x. I could write y equals y of x if I like. It's like I have a y of x there, but I didn't write it. I need the chain rule. The outside function is the squaring function. The inside function is y of x. I get 2y times the derivative of y prime of x, which I'll write in Leibniz notation as dy dx. And the derivative of 4 is 0. I can now solve this equation for dy dx by subtracting 2x from both sides and then dividing both sides by 2y to get negative x over y. And then I can plug in this point to figure out the slope. dy dx at this point, x is 1, y is square root of 3 is negative one over square root of three. That is the slope of the tangent line at this point. I know that was fast because we were out of time. We'll do plenty more examples on Friday. This is related to multivariable calculus functions because it helps us understand these contour maps that I'm talking about, including in more complicated situations. Have a good day.